Thank you. Um, thank you, Sidra. Thank you, Maria. And um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for those kind words of introduction. And uh, the only thing I would add, and I was a little inspired by Dr. Geng yesterday because uh, when he shared his background, because background sort of matters because it helps us decide which direction we're going. And so um, while I'm pulling up my slides here, I thought I'd tell you a little bit. Yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a physician trained in India, practiced in India, um, and then came to pursue uh, further uh, studies. And at the time I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, uh, but the idea that I would, I would continue with my medical uh, clinical practice, but discovered public health and epidemiology. Um, and, and that is what has um, uh, driven me. And I found that as I developed in that space, implementation science uh, as a field was also coalescing and developing. And it really helped bring both my, my clinical and my uh, uh, research, public health research backgrounds together because it's actionable and um, it's so stakeholder engagement driven. And so as I talk a little bit more, you'll see uh, where that comes from. Uh, so with that, I need to share my screen. Uh, Citrum, I'm not sure, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, you should be able to see my screen, Sidra? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So um, the topic for, uh, for today, this morning, is planning your implementation research study. Um, yesterday's set of talks were really enlightening. It was great to hear Dr. Fernandez start off with this overview of implementation science. And, um, and then the, the, the discussions and, and really fantastic uh, talks by Dr. Gang, Dr. Ramaswamy, really sort of gave us a, a nice flavor of what implementation science it, it looks like in certain global contexts and topics, as well as this idea of quality improvement and improvement science. Um, I think you will see in my planning your implementation research study, the next 30 minutes or so, you'll see uh, several of those things coming back. And, and I hope that it will help connect the dots uh, a little bit. So this is a slide you saw yesterday uh, with, that Dr. Fernandez showed that I just thought I'd bring it back to remind ourselves as we start, get back on the same page about what is truly implementation science and what the focus is. So again, it's, it's about developing or testing effective strategies for implementing evidence-based practices. And this is always so important in, um, when we're starting to develop a research study so that we have the clarity of the fact that we're, we're thinking strategies and evidence-based practices kind of hand in hand. Um, another uh, purpose of implementation science is to understand all these different processes, barriers, facilitators that can influence success or failures of implementing strategies at, and evidence-based practices. And, and um, really to highlight that context matters in a big way in implementation science. And you all know that, but just to bring it back, it's because we're gonna be talking about measuring all of these things. Uh, this is another slide to remind uh, and, uh, us, all of us and get on the same page about uh, what the focus of implementation is versus effectiveness. So in effectiveness, um, as Dr. Fernandez uh, had showed, uh, the focus is intervention, the evidence-based intervention or, or any sort of health promotion intervention, and that we're measuring its effects on health outcomes. In implementation, on the other hand, the, the focus is the system to support and adapt, adopt the delivery of perhaps another evidence-based intervention with fidelity. And the intervention kind of goes into the background a little bit. And um, we're measuring we're measuring implementation strategies and implementation outcomes. So with just, you know, sort of that, that was a centering two slides to get us all back onto the purpose and the aims of implementation science. 
Um, and then let's go into, I sort of try to make this a little bit um, formulaic cookbook step-by-step -step guide to planning and implementation research study. And so I came up with, you'll, you'll find a lot of these things uh, in several sources that I have cited as, as you'll see my slides, but I also kind of combined them uh, to come up with 10 steps to planning and implementation research study. And I'll kind of, you know, talk through or, or read what these 10 steps are so that it, we all assimilate it a little bit, right? Step one, frame or identify your research question. Step two, create an implementation logic model. Step three, pick an implementation science theory, model, or framework. Step four, identify implementation strategies. Step five, select a research method or a set of research methods. Step six, select the study design. Step seven, choose measures and an evaluation approach or another evaluation framework. Step eight, secure funding. Step nine, conduct study. Step 10, December. Um, there is some literature uh, and, and some guidance um, around uh, securing funding. And if you see step one through seven, that also then helps with the writing up perhaps of a, uh, of a grant proposal to secure funding. But steps one through seven also help design um, even with less funding or, or for an agency, uh, an implementation plan for your project. So I put sort of step eight at secure funding. I, I put secure funding at step eight because you're going to need step one to seven, one to seven to design uh, any kind of study, but also to write up a proposal, in my opinion. So let's go through all of these steps one by one. Step one, frame the research question. Um, on U University of Washington's website, there are some really, really good resources, and you will see that I've borrowed from that heavily, but they're just fantastic resources. One of them is this. Uh, before we start even thinking about you know, planning, implementing a research study. Um, uh, there's a paper by Dr. Lane Fall here that talks about locating yourself on the subway of where you are in the implementation process. And so this sort of goes back again to remind us what the focus of implementation science. So perhaps you start at this intervention or a practice of interest. This may be a cancer screening. This may be some mental health counseling. This may be uh, a vaccine. So you start somewhere there. And the first question is, has the intervention or this practice of interest shown efficacy um, and that it has improved specific outcomes? And if the answer is no, then you're kind of going down the path of doing more efficacy research. Uh, and also at the same time, thinking through designing for implementation. If the answer is yes, then the next question on this subway line is, well, has the intervention or practice of interest shown effectiveness? So efficacy is, is in tight controlled situations and effectiveness is in the real world. And in, in that situation, if it has not been shown in the real world, you're going down effic effectiveness research. Now that doesn't mean implementation science does not have a role to play because if there is no or maybe partial there are hybrid effectiveness implementation trials, which Dr. J.D. Smith later in the day is going to talk about, and I'll touch about it in a little bit in, in one of my steps. If the intervention has been shown to be effective, then you have a few options. You're still sort of going down the train line of saying, well, we need some mixed method studies to understand the context in which that intervention has been implemented, and perhaps the context in which or other contexts in which the implementation of this intervention might be planned. Then the next is, well, once you understand context better, then design the strategies that can support the adoption and implementation of that intervention or practice of interest. And then go on to further rigorously test the implementation strategies themselves. So as an example, an implementation strategy um, might be training or might be uh, providing um, capacity building and facilitation support. And we want to test if that strategy to implement a certain practice is in fact effective in improving implementation outcomes. So when, when we have a 
the idea for an implementation study in mind, kind of walking through this subway line helps us place ourselves in whether we're ready for a full-on strategy testing implementation, whether we're in the space where we need some more uh, research to first understand context, um, or, or perhaps that we need more work to be done in better, uh, better establishing the evidence base of the intervention or, in, or practice of interest. And so I always find this extremely useful in the right at the beginning of planning my study and starting to think about what is my question. So part of asking the question is also identifying the problem. And so one of the things you'll see here is um, planning an implementation research study is not coming out of left field. These are principles we use in planning any kind of, rigorously planning any kind of research study. But there are some nuances which I'm, I'm gonna try to bring out as we go. Um, so what, what, to identify the problem that we are trying to tackle in a study, we obviously need a thorough understanding of the context. Um, specifically for implementation research studies, there is a real uh, emphasis and focus on identifying stakeholders because as you know, our stakeholders are often implementers and um, clinicians, researchers, community workers, NGOs, and engagement of those stakeholders is really important in um, identifying context-specific strategies that, that, that can help with adopting implementation in the conduct of the study, in the design of the study. And there's a lot of um, research out there that shows that um, extensive and meaningful stakeholder engagement, in fact, really helps with implementation and it's effective in, in improving outcomes. I know that Dr. Bro is going to speak quite a bit about community engaged uh, uh, in implementation research in a little bit. So you'll get to hear some more about this. The third part about identifying the problem then is identifying or specifying what your evidence-based intervention is. And I put a little star because this paper, uh, revi revisiting concepts of evidence and implementation science is just came out in, I think this week or last week's issue of implementation science. And I highly encourage you to uh, read it because it helps to think about the, what is the concept of evidence? It isn't just everything that comes out of a randomized control trial. Um, and, and the authors who, um, here's Dr. Gang, who is part of the uh, author group here, but the authors really uh, put that in sort of three levels of evidence, level one, level two, level three, and describe some of those evidence. I think in, uh, in research in under-resourced environments and countries, uh, the levels of evidence, in my opinion, gets even more important for boots on the ground work that we're doing. Sometimes in, in our grant proposal, there's quite a lot of emphasis on um, established evidence from randomized control trials. And while it, that has its place, I, I'm sure that a lot of you will appreciate that the challenges we have on the ground when we are implementing, um, when we want to implement some, some sort of a practice is that the evidence base may not be as strong. And, I, and this idea of identifying the evidence-based intervention needs to be very critically thought through. And I think this paper really helps us think through those aspects. And of course, then uh, decisions of what, how much evidence is good enough are decisions we need to make with our stakeholders. Um, followed by a focused literature review. Now, notice that I didn't say a systematic review that takes months to do, You're really a scoping review or a focused literature review that can get um, you uh, enough of a background on the problem so that you are starting off from a place where uh, there is some, some foundation from the literature that helps you uh, design your study. Perhaps there's been something done in a similar setting in, as the one that you are trying to implement your study. And then there's a lot to be learned from there. So conduct a focused literature review. And then go on to formulate your very specific research question and research objectives. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So after you've done sort of this identifying the problem, then um, the, the, the focus comes down to framing a question. And in terms of designing a robust, uh, research study, any research study, let's say in this case, we're talking about an implementation research study, the specificity of the question uh, 
is really important for everything that happens after, after that, which is identifying your method, design measures, and so on and so forth. If, if the question is not honed down thoughtfully and, 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 and critically, it makes the design of the rest of the uh, study that much more difficult, confusing, having to come back to the question and, and then again, tweak the question a little bit. So spending a, a, a good amount of time uh, upfront, again, talking with your team members as well as your stakeholders and framing the right question becomes important. Um, going back to this University of Washington website that is um, uh, provides a lot of uh, almost uh, a uh, synthesis of some of the great ideas in implementation science. Uh, they've sort of put together some buckets of how we might think of questions. Implementation research questions may be questions relating to the objective of, such as exploring, describing, influencing, explaining, predicting. And if you see these verbs that are used here, uh, in essence, this questions relating to these objectives are, are often related to observational studies, exploring the context in which a study needs to be implemented, describing perhaps the barriers and facilitators that we may know, uh, we may want to identify in our current context perhaps influencing or explaining some phenomenon that you already are observing on the ground, like why is it happening? Um, and and in, in that case, you'd be designing studies that are observational, that are often mixed methods, uh, including qualitative, quantitative, and, and you're gonna go down. And the questions would be about that, to describe you know, X, Y, Z, to explore. So I encourage you to use these verbs. The second set of questions are related to the challenge of scaling up an evidence-based intervention and a strategy, challenge of sustaining that intervention, of replicating it, of integrating it into, we, we, we heard um, Dr. Dr. Arhangi talk a lot about in integration yesterday, around equity and equitability and re demonstrating real world effectiveness. And so these are sort of the questions that I look at and I'm thinking, oh, I think I'm gonna need some sort of an intervention study here. Um, so I hope that this helps think through about how we frame the question. In addition to the, the high level, you know, where is my question in the space of influencing or, or describing or, or implementing some intervention? Um, there are also some, some very specific things about a, a research question that, uh, again, helps to uh, get that, hone down that questions. Uh, the question, uh, should be relevant, of course, appropriate, problem-driven, actionable, specific, innovative, and generalizable. Um, I find that these descriptions really help me get to all of, all of the, the specificity I need in the research question that I'm trying to design. So um, here's an example that I, I worked through in my head, and let's see if it works. Uh, to design the question, right? So what are the most effective strategies to improve the use of evidence-based smoking cessation counseling services among patients at risk for heart disease? This is the question I came up with and I said, well, let's see if it meets this criteria. And so I went through the list and said, well, is it relevant to individuals, to health systems, to policymakers? And so it brings us back to the, the smoking cessation counseling services, uh, are, is it needed? And of course, for patients with heart Heart, at risk for heart disease, this evidence-based service perhaps is needed and, and is important also to policymakers. Is it appro appropriate? And so then I was asking, well, can it be answered with a thoughtfully planned approach? And I came away thinking, yes, I think I can do this. Is it problem-driven? Problem is it addressing a specific gap or a challenge? Which in this case is that, you know, smoking is a, a huge risk factor for heart disease. Is it actionable? And that kind of goes with uh, problem driven, which is can, can I then identify effective strategies to help implement these services? Is it specific? Is there a precise focus in a well defined population? Is it innovative? Does it add information and improve knowledge? And, and you'll see innovative is not a rocket science, it's not about um, this whole new cool way that nobody has ever done before. But the idea is that it's incremental innovation. You wanna add information and improve knowledge on what 
what we already know. And in implementation science, often it's hard to demonstrate uh, innovation that is that's completely out there and never done before because we are working already with evidence-based interventions. And then is it generalizable? So we're striving for our strategies to have application across contexts to the extent possible. So that, that sort of covers at a high level, the idea of identifying and framing the research question. Step one, quite a lot of uh, upfront work that actually will pay off down the road. So in step two, it's creating an implementation logic model. And uh, Dr. Smith is the developer of this implementation research logic model, and he will talk extensively about it. But I wanted to just put it here to say that it's, a, it's one of the logic models and approaches that helps with the planning, executing, reporting, and synthesizing the findings of a implementation research study. Um, and you'll see these are empty boxes that, that you can use as a worksheet to fill out that are focused on the determinants um, of the intervention and that then are designed with the, uh, the that, are, that um, sorry, the determinants of the intervention where certain implementation strategies can address those determinants to then identify the mechanisms by which those strategies affect determinants and, res and resulting in specific types of outcomes. And you'll see, you'll see me talk through these also as we go through further steps. But here's one way to start thinking about how you plan and execute and report and write out a logic model of um, what your study is all about. Here's another one that uh, I, I stole, uh, borrowed from Dr. Fernandez, which is parts of the implementation mapping, which she's also going to talk about. Where here, step five is planning for implementation and the implementation mapping process really helps go through the tasks of um, identifying strategies, but even before you get to identifying strategies, some of the things that are still needed to think through the planning of your implementation study, which is conducting a needs assessment. And I, I spoke a little bit about these aspects when I talked about the, the fight identifying the problem, perhaps from the literature. Whereas in implementation mapping, some of these things might be done uh, prospectively as new data collection. But again, it's a framework or or some sort of a model to help get uh, what you know about your research study, starting to organize it and what you're going to go about and do it. Um, here's another one that's related. It is related to implementation mapping that helps you do that a little bit more. Um, I know that one of the things is you'll hear Dr. Mark Fernandez talk about this implementation mapping to identify implementation strategies. But as you understand this a little better, you'll see that it also starts to help you organize what you are doing in a research implementation research study. So I, I find it useful from both perspectives. Um, there are one of the things that I didn't touch on in the implementation logic model is that there are also the more generic, and you'll find this if you just even Google search it, more generic idea of having a logic model that tells us from what are the inputs to what are the outcomes. And I'm sure you all may be very familiar with using that, which also helps to put things together. But I, I wanted to pick out some specific implementation related logic models. Step three is now um, the important aspect, which we heard a lot about yesterday, about picking an implementation science theory That's model the or framework. Sorry, um, is there a question or perhaps? Someone is unmuted. Thank you. Sorry, Bajal, someone was unmuted. I just muted them. Oh, okay, thank you. Step three is picking an implementation science theory model or framework. Um, we heard a lot about this yesterday and um, you wanted to sort of synthesize it just to really say how using theory is a cornerstone of implementation science. Uh, it provides a systematic structure for the development, management, and evaluation of studies. It helps to enhance effectiveness of the intervention. It, it ensures that we are including some and, and identifying appropriate implementation strategies, uh, enhances interpretability of findings. It helps to link the aims, the designs, the measures, and the analysis approaches. Um, and it probably even 
helps advance theories in the field. You can expand on the field. We talked about this a little bit, and that's where the source of innovation comes from, uh, where certain models uh, can be used from outside of health. Dr. Geng spoke of several of those. And so I, I thought that yesterday's uh, talks really helped think through the importance of theories and frameworks. Um, and Dr. Fernandez had shared this, this slide, which again, I, as she said, I encourage you all to read this paper about how all of these theories and models and frameworks are organized so that uh, you get a sense of picking from one of these that, in a way that is relevant to the question that you had designed in step one. The consolidated framework for implementation research is one that's used extensively. And part of the attractiveness of this framework is that it is a meta-theoretical framework, meaning that it is a, um, is a systematic review. It's informed by a lot of other uh, theories frame and, and conceptual frameworks. And so it gives a very, I, I feel like, I, I, so far I would say if I tried to fit a study using a CIFR framework, I am able to use it. But there are lots of others that you also might find beneficial. So I wanted to share this one example from work that I've been, I've been involved in uh, for a few years, where we use the consolidated framework for implementation research and another model that was empirically de derived uh, from primary care practices. And you don't need to go into all the details of what is in this table, but to show you how uh, for this question that we developed, which is what are the practice, organizational and contextual factors associated with meeting metrics for, and these ABCS stand for aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking performance among smaller primary care practices in the paper where we describe the results I hear. But it's this kind of the mapping constructs and measures onto domains of a conceptual framework uh, that then allowed us to also design a study, well, how are we collecting? Where do we have information that could go into perhaps a survey or a assessment template or some sort of a practice information form? And so the frameworks helped us then think through what we wanna measure and how we want to measure it that then helped us answer this question. So really what's in here is not as critically important as just the approach we took in trying to answer this research question using the conceptual frameworks. Moving on to step four then of designing your study is identifying implementation strategies. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because Dr. Fernandez is going to cover this. Um, but to remind us, strategies are the methods or techniques or the how-to that are used to enhance adoption, implementation or sustainability of a clinical or public health program or practice. So it is the how-to aspect of changing practice. Um, strategies can be, are categorized in many, many different ways. And there's a lot of literature uh, out there that it, it's, I encourage you to read, but it, it has helped me to think about whether in my implementation study, I'm going to, um, uh, whether I'm identifying a strategy or for the, for the evidence-based intervention, whether I need a discrete strategy, which often involves one action or a process such as education. Uh, am I gonna use a multifaceted strategy, which is combining several different strategies in a package of strategies, um, or whether it's some sort of a blended approach. And I think sometimes I personally am not clear on whether blend, blend difference between blended and multifaceted. And I say that because um, there is also the idea of multi-component uh, strategies. There is the idea of a bundle of strategies. And that comes from the field uh, rel being relatively new and also ad advancing at the same time and innovating. And so you'll see terminology in implementation science that can often be confusing because it's new. Uh, the idea I, for me really is to say, well, is am I, am I using just one specific strategy or am I combining different strategies to address um, some of the deter determinants or barriers and facilitators in my context? And then that helps get down to what strategies we will use to in increase adoption and implementation of the evidence-based intervention. Um, here's a, a figure that helps uh, think about 
being specific and in reporting the implementation strategies. And I find this useful in the planning of a research study because if we have clarity in the strategy that you're using, defining it and specifying it, it also then helps with its implementation. It then helps with its reporting as well. And that helps advance the field a little bit. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, an example of doing, doing this here. So here we go. Here's um, an example of an intervention where we want to integrate uh, behavioral health practices in patients with diabetes. And then the hypothesis there is that patients who have diabetes uh, and have um, moderate to severe depression often have problems managing their own diabetes. And so how can we, uh, in, a, in a practice, in a clinic, how can we get clinics to integrate both of those aspects of care in patients um, in, in, and have them adopt some of those strategies? So the strategy that we uh, decided to use for that intervention is practice facilitation. Practice facilitation is, is this multifaceted, lots of things going on in this strategy that, that gets interpreted and used in many different ways. So for this study, we wanted to get a little more specific and we defined it to say it's an approach to supporting improvement, clinical uh, quality improvement in clinics. And it's focused on building organizational capacity for continuous improvement. And you, if you were here yesterday, you heard a lot of conversation discussion about this aspect of building capacity in primary care practices when Dr. Ramaswamy was talking about quality improvement. So now let's try to get more specific. So the actor is the facilitator. The action is engaging practice leadership, identifying gaps, setting data-driven goals, so on and so forth. The target is the practice or the team, the change team. Um, we specified that it would be done monthly for about 12 months. Uh, there'll be one in-person contact per month for 12 months of 60 to 90 minutes. So we got more specific about the dose. Our outcome was adoption and penetration of that strategy into the clinic. And the justification was that the lack of capacity, the, that clinics have a lack of capacity due to competing time and resource constraints. And that really helps think through all of the aspects about this strategy. There are other uh, models of developing and selecting strategies uh, in addition to implementation mapping Dr. Fernandez is the developer and is gonna talk more about it. Step five, selecting the research method. So there are several types of methods. And again, this is not something you will be an unfamiliar with. We have heard about quantitative methods, qualitative methods, and mixed methods. And I put some examples here of quant, qual, and mixed methods. Uh, in implementation research studies, almost always we have you know, if it is about designing and implementing and strategy intervention, we always have mixed methods to integrate qualitative and quantitative. It just gives us the right mix of depth and, and, and richness with the breadth and reaching a larger population to understand the aspects of intervention. So as you develop the study, start thinking about whether, uh, if it's an observational study, whether uh, you're only going to do surveys or get quality measures, or are you also going to supplement that with some more interviews and direct observation and focus groups? So here's an example where in, one, in AIM-1, one, uh, we conducted a, a cluster randomized trial and the quantitative aspect of this study really was about the outcome measurement, which was from clinical quality and from medical records. But to support that, we also did a mixed methods evaluation of the implementation and we qualitatively assessed implementation and sustainability. Um, the primary research question was mixed methods because it also had survey measures from patient organizational and external factors to supplement these outcome measures that we were interested in, uh, which were implementing sustainability. So that allowed us to do that. And we selected six higher and six lower change clinics um, to, to do that mixed method. So just wanted to show you in a real example as you develop a study, whether there is the quant and the qual and how you're in, you might be integrating that. Step six is selecting the study design. So I'm going just a little bit fast so we can get through our steps here. Um, the, so I said traditional study designs. These are study designs uh, you might be familiar with for other research studies, which are experimental, quasi-experimental observation, also used in implementation research studies. Um, now I won't go into much detail, 
What you'll hear later today is this idea of hybrid implementation effectiveness design, where you're balancing effectiveness and implementation research, where on this one end of it, it is a test of the strategies itself. On the other hand, it's still a test of the actual clinical or prevention intervention while you're still gathering information on implementation. And then in the middle is where you're, you might be testing both the effectiveness of the intervention as well as testing or studying the effectiveness of the implementation strategy. And so you'll hear a, a lot more about this. What I do wanna bring up, and I think I have that here, is that the hybrid type designs right, are, are a way to describe whether it's just effectiveness, just implementation or both. The, the study design, the research study design is often the cluster randomized trial or the mixed methods survey, ob mixed methods observational design. So I wanted to sort of distinguish this a little bit, right? So in this, in this example that I showed you before, we did do a hybrid effectiveness implementation where we're wanting to study both the intervention and the implementation strategy, but we did it through a cluster randomized trial. And then in AIM-2, we in fact used a positive deviance approach, which is another type of study um, and, and a comparative qualitative analysis approach. So you'll see, you'll see these kinds of distinctions and to not get confused to that, the hybrid type is a, a, a research design. It's a way to des describe where you are in the testing of the effectiveness implementation, you know, balance, equilibrium. All right, so step seven is choosing your measures and evaluation approach. And I wanted to just bring this model that's used extensively. Uh, and this is uh, Dr. Proctor's model of uh, implementation outcomes, where there are the evidence-based practices and the strategies that um, are used to implement these evidence-based practices and the outcomes. And so to note that implementation outcomes are outcomes such as feasibility, penetration, acceptability, uptake costs. Uh, and these are outcomes related to the strategies in that the hypothesis would be that improvement in, in these outcomes would then result in better service outcomes such as safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, and then downstream client outcomes, which are often the clinical outcomes. And so again, thinking through this set of outcomes with the guidance of whether they're implementation service or client helps with the planning of your research study. Um, some considerations when you're thinking about outcomes is that think about outcomes that focus on an important and pressing service system problem. What's the gap? What are the current levels of the evidence base that you're testing? Um, highly, highly encourage that, be, that these outcomes be derived from your guiding conceptual model or framework that we talked about in step two. Uh, the outcomes should also help inform mechanisms or processes by which change is happening because you want to replicate it in other settings. And so if, if, you, if you're paying attention to that, it will help do that. Uh, be measured using psychometrically validated measures and or with rigorous qualitative methods. Um, and I bring this because the, our, our knowledge base on psychometrically tested measures is also increasing, but it's not perfect. So you want to think about that a little bit. And of course, you want to uh, try to have these outcomes in a way that you know they might be linked to distal outcomes. Either you are measuring it in your own study or um, uh, that there is face validity to it. Sometimes some of these things get a little harder to uh, demonstrate in real studies. There's also the measurement of contextual factors and or predictor variables. And so think through, brainstorm with your stakeholders, what are those potential barriers and facilitators? Use determinants frameworks, such as the socio-ecological model or consol consolidated framework of implementation research. Uh, think about measuring at multiple levels, at the, at the individual, at the system, at the team level, perhaps even at the community level and policy level. Uh, again, try to use validated measures and prioritize the most important and changeable factors when you're measuring because contextual me fact measurement of contextual factors can get exhaustive because there are so many of them. And as it's shown here in table in this table, that is um, from the from the chapter that Dr. Fernandez talked about that we just recently contributed to this book on practical implementation science. Um, 
Uh, I also then encourage you to think about using evaluation frameworks. REAIM, like CIFR, is CIFR is a determinants framework, but REAIM is a very popular evaluation framework because it, it, it has this comprehensive look at how um, uh, the reach of the intervention in the target population, its effic efficacy or effectiveness, how, how well it's being adopted, implementation and maintenance, and so for each of these uh, re-aim uh, domains, uh, you, might, you can use it as an evaluation framework and have implementation outcomes associated with them. And then I combined these three steps together because I felt like it was out of the scope of my talk this morning about securing funding, conducting the study and disseminating results, but really important aspects um, of doing this study after you have planned it with a lot of attention. And this table, uh, you're going to have the slides. It's in the it's in um, uh, a paper that's written about what are the ingredients, you know, the best ingredients for writing a winning implementation research proposal by all of the different sections that are typically seen seen in a grant proposal. I won't go into detail, but I just wanted to show you just how detailed uh, advice that I use all the time when I'm writing grant proposal. And all of these training opportunities that Dr. Fernandez also had in her slides, which we just wanted you to have as resources, and I just put them in my slides so that you have them in another place. And with that, um, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. I felt like I had to rush through a little bit, but I think I covered it all. <laughs>